It would not feel right to cover news about the cybersecurity industry without sharing the passing of Sophia de Antoine. Sophia was an active and beloved member of the New York City cybersecurity community, successful threat researcher, founder, advisor, and friend to many. Margin Research, the cybersecurity company Sophia founded, will continue to operate under the leadership of her sister, Dr. Claudia de Antoine. The love that poured from the community when learning of her tragedy was apparent both offline and online. The community misses you, Sophia, and your legacy will be remembered. Imagine this. You're a hacker from far off Genovia looking to steal that sweet, sweet loot from your victim. Only problem, your target uses two-factor authentication, those six-digit codes you're sometimes texted when logging in. Your attack is spoiled, or is it? Well, fear not. If you're able to pull off a SIM swap, you'll be in business. That's the attack where you convince the target's mobile carrier to transfer their phone number to a SIM card you control, thus letting you intercept those pesky two-factor authentication codes. Only issue is how to get a T-Mobile employee to make the swap. Now imagine this other scenario. You're a retail sales associate making $10 to $18 an hour at T-Mobile, and you get an interesting text. It says, I got your number from the T-Mobile employee directory. I'm looking to pay someone up to $300 per SIM swap done. If you're interested, reply and we can talk. Now, obviously, you or I in this scenario, not an issue. Report the spam and move on. We're ethical hackers, right? But as we know, not everyone is going to be so. According to the mobile report and corroborated on Reddit, employees at T-Mobile have been receiving just these messages. They each claim to offer $300 per SIM swap. When asked for comment, T-Mobile stated, we did not have a systems breach. We continue to investigate these messages that are being sent to solicit illegal activity. We understand other wireless providers have reported similar messages. Cue the reference to the famous 2016 University of Luxembourg study where 47% of participants happily exchanged their passwords for a chocolate bar. Recommendation, if you're using two-factor authentication, which you should be, opt for an MFA app rather than text messages some like Google's Authenticator, or some like Microsoft's. I'd love to hear your favorite, and let me know in the comments. And if you're a T-Mobile customer, it's a good idea to enable SIM protection on your account. Links in the description. The team at Velexity dropped a major CVE this week for all of Palo Alto Networks' products. The CVE numbered CVE 2024-3400 was given a CVSS score of 10 due to enabling unauthenticated remote code execution on all devices running the Global Protect Pan OS network security monitoring tools. The CVE was discovered by Velexity while inspecting suspicious network traffic coming from a customer's firewall. Remote code execution is enabled by a Python backdoor dubbed UpStyle. In their investigation, Velexity discovered this exploitation being used against PanOS users as early as March 26, 2024. The one bright side of this is that they've deduced that this exploitation is exclusively being used by one threat actor named UTA0218. Backdoor is placed by the attackers. They use requests to non-existent web pages containing specific patterns. According to Justin Elzey on Twitter, as well as the team over at Watchtower, the attack happens by taking advantage of parsing the cookie session ID. Then the backdoor parses the log files for the web server looking for the specific command pattern. Once found, the command is executed and the output is appended to a CSS file included in the firewall. The log entry is then removed and after a determined delay, the output of the command execution is removed and the CSS file is restored to its previous state. I would try to get a bit more specific about how the backdoor is placed. However, those details have not been disclosed by Velexity or Palo Alto Networks. However, the Watchtower team has released their proof of concept as mentioned above. The situation is still evolving and Palo Alto Networks is rapidly releasing hot fixes for the CVE. Some previous patches released by Palo Alto Networks have already been deemed ineffective. We will continue to monitor the situation. Elon and his team accidentally hosted the Link Fishing Olympics on the Twitter platform this week. In a post shared by the team over at Krebs on Security, they discovered that all links on the platform that contained Twitter.com were changed to X.com. And I don't mean complete strings of just Twitter.com, but any link that contained Twitter.com in it was changed. Fishers were able to quickly catch on, and there was an uptick in domain registrations to take advantage of this. The fish works due to bad string replacements. Links like C-A-R-F-A Twitter.com would be shown as C-A-R-F-A-X.com or Carfax.com. 
The team at Krebs found that at least 60 domains taking advantage of this string replacement were registered in 48 hours. They do believe that many of the domains were registered defensively and not offensively. Quickly after the release, the Twitter team reverted their oopsie and the string replacement no longer works. As a software engineer and someone interested in security, this is extremely frustrating to hear happen. It almost feels like a leak code algorithm question gone wrong. Say you have 100 million strings, some containing the string twitter.com. How would you go about replacing that string with the string x.com? And the reply was the most brute force answer, aka the first reply I would give. Just use string.replace twitter.com comma x.com? It feels as though a good regex would have solved this problem easily and elegantly, but it feels like this solution wasn't even ran by a security team. I think right now, most of the Twitter security teams are actually just full-time engineers because on Twitter, I follow two security people or people who have Twitter security in their bio, and one is working on live streaming and the other one is also a SpaceX employee. Given that Twitter is also building their own AI, maybe they could have asked it for some ideas for good regex solutions, or more concerningly, this is the reply that the Twitter AI gave them. A new vulnerability was found and reported for the Putty client for Windows. Discovered by Fabian Bomber and Marcus Brinkman, CVE 2024-31497 affects all Putty tools versioned 0.68 to 0.80. A significant security flaw has been found in the system that creates signatures using ECDSA private keys associated with the NISD P521 curve. This issue occurs when PuTTY or Pageant, the SSH authenticator for PuTTY, PSCP, PSFTP, and Plink generate a signature from a key during the process of authenticating a user to an SSH server. An attacker in possession of a few dozen signed messages and the public key has enough information to recover the private key and then forge signatures as if they were from you, allowing for them, for instance, to log into any server you use that key for. Signatures can be collected by attackers via temporary access to a server or a copy of pageant holding the key. It is recommended that those that use the ECDSA private keys generated using the NIST P521 curve revoke them immediately and remove all old public keys from relevant SSH servers and generate a new key pair to replace it. Thank you for watching this week's episode of ThreatWire. In last week's episode, we talked a bit about a new kind of email phishing attack. This one comment by Mr. Miyagi5 made me laugh. Email and HTML was a mistake, bros. I saw a lot of people commenting, asking for mitigations for the average person against this phishing attack. To be honest, it's a sneaky attack, so my recommendation is to always proceed with caution. If something seems off in an email, be sure to double check with the sender in a different thread and be specific when checking. Thank you to Darren for writing the T-Mobile story this week. We went live on the channel to write ThreatWire together and we're probably gonna do it again in the near future. Next week, there will not be a ThreatWire video as I will be celebrating Passover. But maybe as an alternative, I'll post a few YouTube shorts. How do people even feel about YouTube shorts? I would love to hear in the comments below. As a reminder, the book club is starting next week, April 24th. So if you wanna participate, please hop over to patreon.com slash threatwire. I'll post the starting time for the live stream this weekend. So look forward to receiving that information soon. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to be spending a bit more time over there and in the Discord group. If you want to pass some suggestions of how you want to see the Patreon evolve, shoot me a DM. I hope you enjoyed ThreatWire for the week of April 15th, 2024. I'm Allie Diamond. You can find me everywhere online at Ending with Allie. Good luck, have fun, and don't get caught.